Mm -hmm. Here, I'm going to start the recording. So, Howard. <laughs> I um, would like to say I love the Chinese government and all their policies. Thank you for what you do. <laughs> and es especially their military. Oh, the great and glorious ones, yes. <laughs> They'll appreciate that, I'm sure. And we're running out of patience for waiting on the Taijin question because I have no patience. Like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see. Did you want me to do the the yes. presentation first? Yes. yes. Yeah. All right. Like that's gonna answer the Tajin question. <laughs> yeah. She, so welcome very much, Razia and sharing us not only food, but culture from Morocco. Yay. <laughs> so Morocco is a country that is 12 centuries old. So we still have, if you go to the old Medinas, which are the old cities, Things are still built the old fashioned way. You are still have narrow streets that you cannot get into if you don't go using a um, donkey or a horse. Uh, and it's basically a walking place. So um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. So this is a map that shows where is Morocco located. There is a lot of people who mistake the location of Morocco. No, it's not in Asia, it's not in Europe, it's in North of Africa. It's very close to Spain, as you can see. Um, it's like half an hour in a boat from the extreme north place in Morocco to the extreme south place in Spain. Um, we have around 3,500 kilometer in ocean and it ha we have like Atlantic Ocean and um, Mediterranean Ocean Sea. So basically, very much a multicultural country. Excuse me. Is it very much a different culture? Because uh, you're breaking up, or your audio is breaking up. So is it very much a multicultural country because it's by the ocean? Well, I, I will explain that in another slide, but uh, we have a lot of uh, foreigners in Morocco right now um, for a lot of reasons. A lot of people choose to become retire in Morocco, especially from France. Uh, due to the historical relationship we have with them, with the country. Um, so a lot of people who retire to come and retire in Morocco, especially in the Finnish city. And we have a lot, uh, also a lot of British who decide to come and retire in Morocco. Um, the country is, um, I mean, mostly Muslim country, but we have um, Jewish community in Morocco too. So yes, so it's pretty metropolitan country. We have a lot of people from around the world that come and live in Morocco. We started having lately, like in the past few years, a lot of Asian who come to Morocco uh, and started their own business there, and especially restaurants and um, um, business. Like they, they bring their own electronics, technology, and things like that, and they will try to do wholesales in Morocco. So they are really spread into a lot of cities and towns, and uh, they are now accustomed to uh, the culture and they become part of the country. Uh, when it comes to the south of Africa, we have a lot of Africans who choose Morocco as being their, uh, the country of work, so they find a lot of jobs, so they come to work there. Um, or they, um, they chose Morocco to learn about the culture and then migrate to Europe. Um, so Morocco, this is the actual map of Morocco before Morocco was larger than that. We have Mauritania in 
part of Maya included an, a half of Algeria part of the map. But when um, the French, all this area become a French colony, they redivided the, 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 the maps and redivided the area. So we become much more in this uh, flight. So we are actually a kingdom. So we have a king, his name is Muhammad the sixth. And we, ha uh, we have a large population as you can see from the numbers uh, based on the area of Morocco. So it's a big number. It's mostly concentrated in up north and in the middle of the country. The Sahara part has larger, large cities but it's not that highly populated, which is the south. And uh, yes, go ahead. So Morocco is divided to 12 um, states and all those states have something in common basically because uh, they have the same uh, culture and also they try to, when they divided the state, they try to have like each state will have a little bit, a little bit of the sea, a little bit of the Sahara, a little bit of, um, the culture that surrounds it. So they try to keep the same culture clustered all together, but based on the language, on the history and the food also. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Thank you. So Morocco, um, since it's 12 centuries old, we have a number of cities that are called imperial cities. So the first you know, picture that you see that has a lot of colors in it. It's like an old fashioned tannery that still exists. And it's in Fez, Medina. And Fez is um, the oldest capital of Morocco. It's been built by Idris the second, 12 centuries ago. And it has the oldest university in the world that was built in 684, I believe, by Fatima Fihri, which was a businesswoman. After that, we have Rabat, which is the actual capital of Morocco. We have also Marrakesh, which is the touristical capital of Morocco. And then we have Meknes also, that was also part of the capitals of Morocco through this, the history of the country. That sounds confusing. <laughs> well, as you can see, I mean, Rabat is the actual one, Fes was the first one, and through the dynasties, those four basically um, cities were chosen to be capitals through the time. They would switch from one to another through the time until it ended. Got it. They're not all the capitals now. No, but Fes, we call it right now the spiritual capital of Morocco because it has the first university that was built in the world which is Karawiyin or Karawiyin uh, University. And it has a very spiritual you know, air to it. When you go there, you feel like time has stopped because we still have the old Medina, which is the old city. And it's still made the same old fashioned way with the same old streets. And my grandfather has a house there. So when I walk into those neural streets, I feel like time stopped by at the I mean, 12 centuries ago, and I'm just traveling through the time. Next slide. Okay, so, um, so how the regions and people influenced the cuisine of Morocco. So basically, you can move to the next slide. So basically, uh, mm. Morocco, so this is like a small picture of the cuisine, but basically Morocco um, is a Berber country. If we speak about the real people of Morocco, they're Berber. But through the years, Arab people moved from the Middle East, some of them to Morocco to live there. So there is a very small influence by the Middle Eastern cuisine. We don't have much of influence, but after that, Spain was an Arabic country and Spain was a metropolitan country. So it had a lot of people that lived there from different religions, from different cultures. So when Spain uh, 
stopped becoming an Arabic country and it was, they called their conquista of Spain. So Ferdinand took back Spain and pushed all the people who didn't want to convert or didn't want to stay in Spain, pushed them to leave the country. So they moved to Morocco, bringing with them all the culture when it comes to architecture, cuisine, uh, history, clothing, everything, you know, because Spain at that time was very advanced. And in addition to that, people that came from Spain were not only Muslims, but they all were also Jewish. So the Jewish had their own culture too. So they brought that in to the country. And the Berber that lived in Morocco, there were a big chunk of them that were also Jewish. So the Moroccan Berber, the Jewish Berber had their own culture. The, Berber, the other kind of Berber had Muslim Berber, they had their culture. Then the Maurice, the Mauritius, Maurice Kiyun, they call it, that's come, it came from Spain, had their own culture. And then the people that came from um, Middle East, uh, of course, the impact of Mother Africa. So, yes. So this is what made the Moroccan cuisine so diverse and made it so special because all those people brought their culture, their spices and their history. So they mixed and they created a blend of flavors that made Moroccan cuisine today. And Morocco today cuisine is ranked the number two best cuisine of the world. It's not the first time that Moroccan cuisine has um, gained that position. It's they did, we did in 2015, I believe. Next slide. I clicked the button. Oh, there we go. The tagine. The tagine. Yes. There we yes. go. Answer <laughs> <laughs> the question. <laughs> so the tagine, the tagine is a Berber. You know, it's a Berber pot. And the purpose of it is to slow cook the food in a way that it's gonna absorb the flavor of the earth, but also cook it in a very healthy way. So the Moroccan cuisine has this mix between vegetables and meat. And we have a lot of side dishes that we present with the tagine. So this tagine that you see here in this picture are glazed tagine and have a lot of colors and decorations. So those tagine are mainly made for decoration purposes. And you can put them on top of your you know, table and or in your kitchen just for decoration or in the middle of your living room, something like that, just to match a little bit your decor or your house uh, colors or whatever. Uh, we do not uh, advise to cook in a glazed tagine. The reason is that a glazed tagine, when you start cooking in a high heat, well, or in the heat in general, it creates, um, it releases like chemicals, which is very toxic and unhealthy for you. So this is a clay pot tagine that I have here that you can see in, um, I don't know, or if they see it here. This is a clay pot tagine. And it has this lid and the tagine basically when you cook in it, it changed the color. So you can see that the bottom is darker yeah. than the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes, okay. So basically before cooking in it and to prevent a cracking, like you see here, I start having some cracking because of the high heat, because the purpose, as I said, is it needs to be slow cooking. So the heat needs to be a little low and it takes a little longer to cook when you do it in the tagine. So uh, to prevent the cracking, when you buy a new tagine, you need to soak it in water for at least 24 hours. And then you take uh, olive oil and you, you know, just wrap it in olive oil and leave it again for few hours when it's absorbed the oil. So you wait, you have to cook the pot before you can cook in the pot. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's like exactly. seasoning a cast iron skillet. Ah. Yes. So basically you need to keep adding olive oil and letting the you know the tagine absorb it. So like that the clay just you know get um 
more stronger and it's less, you know, um, easy to break. And then when you do all this before cooking it in the stove, because basically in Morocco, in a traditional way, in a village, they will not cook it in a stove. They will have like a small barbecue also made from, a, from clay mm -hmm. and they will turn it on, but it's gonna be very low heat and they will put, you know, the, uh, the tagine in it. They will put some olive oil again and some onion and let it just simmer just for the tagine again to absorb more oil. And after that, let it sit and cool down and start cooking in it. And normally it should not break. But in the stove, there is a big probability that it's gonna have a crack or something. Okay? So this is how it looks like. And normally there is different shape. There is like a triangle lead, lead and there is this one who is a little curved. Um, we have like, you can go uh, or to the next slide, please. So, so where the Berber people would put this like in the fire or something with the coals? I mean, traditionally? Yes, yes with the charcoal, yes. Yeah. Yes. So those are different clay potagines. So like, um, as you saw, there is the normal one that looks like the, this one. And there's two different shapes of the lid. And then there is one that looks like a jar. And this one is well known in a city called Marrakesh. And they cook in it um, meat, basically just meat, um, in the charcoal dust. When the charcoal dust is still very hot, you put this jar in it on top of it and you let your, your tagine cook. The other one that is a little curved from the bottom, it's mostly for soups or stews and also for fish. And it's more common in the north of Morocco. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, go ahead in the next slide. Yes. And of course, to make a successful tagine, you will need spices. Wow. So, so this is like a traditional shop in a soup. Sorry. In Morocco, and if you aye, just aye, go aye. there and choose whatever you know spice you want, of course we have supermarkets and things like that. And now people just go to a big store and grab all the spices they want. It's easier for them than going to uh, to basically a traditional, old-fashioned way market. But those are all spices you can see: cumin, curcuma, um, paprika, and other varieties. And there is also a natural colorant for people who do painting and things like that. So that's when they use natural colorant. Nice. You can go to the next slide, please. Or... But this one's so beautiful. It is. Yeah, it's I... Very colorful. This is, this is not artwork. This is real food. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Oh, this one is too. Oh, look at that. Lemons and olives. Olive is pretty uh, important in our culture. Mm -hmm. And the lemon that you see, it's called preserved lemon. So there is a um, spe specific way to uh, make it. Of course, you, you boil it for a little bit, then you open it, you put a lot of salt, and you put it in a jar, and you keep it like in that jar for a month or two until it becomes a preserved lemon, which is becomes salty and very, um, yeah, it's very used in the Moroccan cuisine, where it's very used with the chickens, uh, chicken tagine, basically, because it removes that um, a little sliminess of the chicken. It, it, it upgrade the dish, basically. It elevate the flavor. Um, the olives are made that way. It's like a, a beautiful picture, but it's in real life really mm -hmm. made that way if you go to somebody's in a traditional market to buy your, your preserved lemon and, and olives. Isn't that like uh, purple olives? Yes, we have purple olives, black olives, um, light purple. The purple olives uh, olive is called... Um, Miss Lella olive. And the green olive, you can, I mean, you can eat it that way, salty, or they add with its pickled, um, um, yeah, pickled, no, pickled vegetables. Yeah. My mouth is 
like wet right now. I'm salivating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and it's so hard to get good olives in the U.S. And it's expensive too. It's not only hard to get it, and it's expensive. Yeah, for like in Morocco, if you tell them give me twenty, uh, like one kilogram, it's around three dollars or something like that, and it's a big bag full of olives. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> You can go to the next slide. And basically the next is slide- Is it possible to eat fresh olives? I've only had like pickled or in oil, like I guess already well, cooked? Black, black olives basically they cured it in, in salt just to kill all the- Well, they're very bitter. Uh, but if you just pick an olive off of an olive tree, it's very bitter. Yeah, it's, it's very bitter. <clears throat> it's better to cure it a little bit in salt just to kill all the-, the, the insects and stuff like that and it's helped it also to to cook quicker i mean to be ready in a quicker way yeah i've also so, heard the olives fresh olives are toxic to humans they have to be brined or pickled somehow in order for humans to be able to digest them and there's no way anybody would ever take a second bite of a raw olive. <laughs> That's right. But if you tried, <laughs> one bite's you know enough. <laughs> it's a it's a one taste, and you spit it out. You would never touch another raw. Olive. Well, obviously, I olive... nibble on everything, and obviously, I've been under an olive tree, and obviously, I listen because I would remember <laughs> your saying, and I don't remember ever eating a raw olive. I mean, the raw olives, basically, they took it uh, straight to the cold press to make oil. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they press them for the oil. Yes. Or you but, salt cure or brine cure or lye cure, but you have to do something to make them edible. Yeah. Yeah, my mom did that. She picked them off the tree and cured them and then brought them back for me. Uh, and in California, I've got olive trees all over my neighborhood. I did it once. It's a lot of work to do a, a um, I did a natural water cure and I did a salt cure. I have not tried the lie and doing it once was enough. I'll buy them now. <laughs> yeah, and the next slides are basically just picture of, pictures of Morocco. This one is in Casablanca and it's the largest and it's the largest mosque uh, in Africa. Wow. And, and it's built on top of the water, basically. It's Mosque Hassan II, which was the father of the actual king. Beautiful. It is. The next picture, oh, please. We'll slide. Yeah, this one basically is called the Blue City and it's Shawin. It's in north of Morocco and all the streets are painted blue. So they say that when uh, people that came from Spain moved to Morocco, they wanted a piece of home. So they painted the walls in blue to remember and to have something that looks like a little bit the street of, you know, an Andalus, where Spain before they called it an Andalus. What is, there's like, is this spices? Is that, there's like a blue spice or is that no, paint? No, I think, I think those are natural colorants. Okay. The, the blue like, is probably indigo. Indigo, yes. Yeah, indigo. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Beautiful. So this is a traditional like home, like Andalusian or Spanish home. That this is when someone's they, house? It can be someone's, this is actually a school, it's the school that I told you about, that is in Fez. But in Fez, most of the houses looks like this. So my grandfather's house is a little bit closer to this with more blue, um, you know, um, color in it. But it's, it's pretty common to have houses that looks like that in Fez and in old cities that are imperial cities that have the old Medina and the new city and the old city. So we, they still reflect the history to the house architecture. Man, this is my favorite cooking class ever. I'm learning stuff too. 
Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, I'm glad you do. <laughs> makes you want to go to Morocco. I'm going to Casablanca. <laughs> Casablanca is a good choice, but I advise you to go to imperial cities and just because Casablanca is considered to be an industrial and economical city. So it's full of, you know, it's like if you go to Chicago here or you go to New York, it's full of, yeah, you know, I'm kind of yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm kind of teasing because of the famous movie Casablanca. <laughs> and you know what? It was never, it was never um, filmed in Morocco, Casablanca. It was in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. But Look, we can pretend. We can too, pretend. Huh? We can pretend. Yes, we can. We can. <laughs> and I mean, the, the scenes that they had that are, they said it's turned in Morocco, we have the same scenery that is really exists close to the beach and stuff like that. Yeah, we still have that cafe. It, it does exist and things like that. It's Rick's not, Cafe. Yeah. Oh, wow. The There's that. the bazaar, the souk. Yes, the souk. This is a traditional soup you can have, like babouche, which are traditional shoes. Um, I mean, bags, clothes, decor, whatever you want, tagines. It's kind of like soup. the old city, old city of Jerusalem. It's the same concept, yes. Yeah, same idea. Yeah. Wow. Ooh. Look at that. This is Uzu Chalel. It's like uh, Uzu Fall. It's called Beautiful. Uzu, and it's a Berber name. Where well, this is when the Sahara, which is the desert, meets the ocean. Nice. Let's have a ride in the camels in the desert. <laughs> This is Casablanca, which is pretty modern. I mean, all the cities of Morocco have a modern. Yeah, that doesn't look romantic at all to me. <laughs> well, um, the, I mean, I it depends a... what you like. I'm originally from Fez, which is an imperial city, and I lived most of my life in Marrakesh, which is another imperial city. So I when see... you tell me go to Ma to Casablanca, I I like it. It's not that bad, but it for me it's it's missing that historical touch yeah it's too we'll long stick with we'll stick with the movie <laughs> there you go modern oh nice i mean we have that in a lot of cities in morocco it just when i chose the pictures i wanted to show you a little bit of the culture and a little bit of um very uh, nice what we still have from the old morocco especially that morocco is a very old um country it's which is 12 centuries old Thank you. Very nice, very nice. Nice presentation. I'm glad you like it. I mean that that's part of it is for many people Morocco is set in old time, right? Not modern. Well, yes, this is the stereotype that a lot of people have, but no. I mean our cities are very modern, the same as you know, big cities in the world. It just we are very proud and very proud of our culture and history and being a very old, you know, kingdom. We would like to show this part of culture that is a little bit forgotten to the world. And wherever you go, you just find new and modern stuff. So we like to show this old or traditional and, and part of the country that is lost in other countries in the world. So we, this is why we emphasize that because we amazing that, culture, yeah. Yeah, I believe that wherever you go, you can see, you know, modernity, you can see how countries evolve with technology and everything, but you're gonna miss the transition and how they switch from the past to the to the future and more people still have both. You can be in the old city and live in the past time, but you can go to the modern city and be, be in the modern time. And you can be in Fest, for example, and both cities and are, are not city, but it's connected. And 
you can, I mean, you can travel through the town very quickly. My, my uncle came visit. He lived, he lived at that time in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And he came and visited and I drove around Southern Illinois and I was like, and you know, the, you give the history and this cemetery was built in 1858 and this one, and he's like, after a little while, he's like, or I live in an apartment that was built before Jesus was born. <laughs> I was just like, I, I shut up. I was just like, I was just being, you know, you know, the tourist give people the tour of the area, right? The history. Yeah, I mean, America being a uh, pretty new continent and country. I mean, they, it was not, I mean, even if you, when you speak to somebody who came from Italy, from, you know, Morocco, from, I don't know, from a country with, you know, very old, you know, culture, it's hard for them to, to connect with, with the place because they like it's pretty new in comparison with what they know but um even though i like uh southern you know it just when i moved here eight years ago i didn't i didn't think that i would fall in love with the area i mean how everything is close by when you want to go somewhere it's not that far it's not i mean and nature is just I mean, I mean, stunning. You cannot, I cannot imagine myself in another place. And every time during this fall season, I imagine a song. I remember a song. I don't know if you know it, guys. It's called uh, "The Indian Summer" by Joe Dassin. And Joe Dassin, he's a French singer, and uh, he had this song about the Indian summer in America, basically. And it's a beautiful song that basically speaks about how the leaves change colors and how the weather and you know the all the colors I mean create this magical you know spirit and this magical you know atmosphere. And we need this. <laughs> all right. Does anybody have any questions about the culture or um Fred, did you get your Tajin question answered? I did, and a, a very good friend of mine who's an Israeli, her neighbor, who's also Israeli, but her family are Moroccan, and so they make the best kind of food. <laughs> yeah, she cooks Moroccan food. So I, I would like to ask about regional food uh, differences in the different parts of Morocco, where it might be more or less spiced or more or less heat used. I was only there for a month and I found the food to be fantastic, but a lot more subtle than maybe Americans think. So as much as I loved everything I had, I didn't think it was overly spiced, um, even though I might've thought it might be going in. So lots of spices, but not overwhelming. Maybe even more more subtle. I mean, I stayed with families in multiple cities, and so I got home cooked meals as well as restaurants. So. Well, basically, the the base of any tagine, like when you cook any tagine, the basics are salt, pepper, not always, but ginger, grounded ginger powder that we're gonna use today, and um, saffron. And basically, that is the base: salt, ginger, and saffron. There is people who add turmeric. I do not add it all the time, but I mean, it's pretty common. It has a very good flavor. We add also parsley, but it depends all the time. All the time um, depends on the dish that we are making. If it's fish, we will add paprika, a little cumin. But if it's meat and chicken, it depends if it's gonna be. Um, a sweet sour dish or it's gonna be just a salty one so uh, and today the dish that we're gonna make is gonna be a berber dish with different vegetables and it's gonna have uh, ginger saffron salt pepper a lot of parsley 
Uh, then I use, normally I wish I should use preserved lemons. Since I didn't find it in the international grocery, I'm gonna just use um, uh, a juice of a squeezed lemon. And olive oil, of course, is very important in the cooking. Oh, I didn't hear you mention chili, so I'm assuming that's not big in the cuisine then? We add, a, no, we don't use chilies. Uh, we use like uh, chili flakes in some dishes, not mm -hmm. all of the dishes. Like yeah. when we are making um, uh, white beans or black beans uh, with tomato sauce and things like that. Mm -hmm. If you like a little spiciness, you can add a little um, uh, chili flakes. Uh -huh. or a jalapeno or something like that. If you like fi with fish, we add a little chili flakes too. Uh -huh. um, I mean, it always depends on people's taste, but my, I mean, basically in the Moroccan cuisine, it's not a spicy cuisine. It's not a, I mean, you're not gonna be like, oh, this is too hot, I cannot handle it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a very yeah. balanced flavor, flavorful cuisine. Thank you. Wait. So what is like a go-to breakfast? Go-to breakfast. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start making the, the bread at the same time, answering it just to gain time because it yeah. needs a little time to rise. Um, okay. But to go to breakfast, basically, it's an egg omelet with cured meat. It's a meat that uh, we add, that I add to it, or we add to it a lot of spices. And we let, it, we let the spices absorb for uh, like overnight. And then the next day we would just uh, put it outside in the sun to dry for a few days. Once it's all dry, we gonna cook it with, it depends on the kind of meat, if it's a cow meat, uh, we will make it, I mean, in a big pot and cook it with beef fat. Um, the same thing with lamb and, and camel. But the thing is, did you say camel? Yes, we can make it the curd meat with camel too. The, but it's not pretty common. It, the, you need, there's few people that basically sell camel, but you, I mean, it's something that is common too. Um, it's probably more valuable alive than as meat, right? But the camel meat has less cholesterol. It's like goat meat. So people that have cholesterol treat camel over them or beef. Um, now for people that have cholesterol and smoke that meat, what I do is I don't cook it in beef fat. I just cook it in a pressure cooker with a little bit of water. Once it's all cooked, in a jar and pour olive oil until you know it's you know top of the jar. But um, I mean, the old-fashioned way is basically to cook it with the fat to preserve it, and basically it's a better way to do it because before, as you know, there were no fridge, no anything. So this way is to preserve meat for as long as possible. Thank you. No, welcome. But we have a lot of um, a lot of <laughs> breakfast things. I mean, we have Moroccan crepes, which is very different from the French crepe. This it's like a pancake, but it has a lot of holes in it. And if you don't have holes in your pancake, it means you you failed your your pancake. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm gonna do now, just for the time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with the bread. So if somebody gonna follow you, if you have a question, let me know. And of course, if you have additional questions at the end, we can chit chat again. I didn't hate salt. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the flour. So normally three cups of flour. I'm making more um, more than the normal amount, so this is why I'm having more um, flour in here. 
I'm gonna now add just the dry ingredients. So basically the flour, the yeast. Yeah. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt. I'm gonna put my olives that I could have, she eats half of it. <laughs> I'm gonna put up my hand left. <laughs> I'm gonna mix all these dry ingredients. I'm gonna pour it with off milk, but not now. Let me let me tell you how much. I'm gonna add a little bit of honey for the sweetness, but also to have the yeast rise just a little bit, like a small table. It needs some sugar. Yes. And I'm going to pour a little bit of milk. of milk just to make the bread soft. Yeah. And I have warm water in here. So I'm going to start putting water. And the dough doesn't have to be perfect because yeah. we will have at the end like a sticky dough. And this is what we want, basically. Yeah. Can you pour the water when I tell you to? Not now. Okay. Yeah, pour the water. How much? Keep pouring, I will tell you. Okay, okay. Oh, here it is. You want to see? Zid. Zid. Stop. <laughs> so this kind of bread, you don't need much. Uh, you don't need to work the dough that much. Yeah. You just need to assemble it. And this kind of bread is not, it's not 100% Moroccan. It's uh, influenced from the French culture since we were a French colony. So we have a lot of French cafes and pastries and bread is part of the things that, um, I mean, we have our traditional bread, but this one with olives, for example, or another kind with sesame or stuff like that. Those kind of breads, we started making them in special occasions like in weddings and things like that, just to make it like a little fancy. So we need just to mix everything and we don't need to make, the, I mean, to use the robots or something like that, because as I said, we just need to assemble the dough and let it rise for robot. just half an hour. Did you see robot? Yeah. So it's almost, I'm almost there. Just I need to um, flip the dough so I can have the bottom goes on top. See? So it's sticky and it's gonna be a little sticky. Don't worry, it needs to be like that. So normally I'm just mixing up to be sure that the yeast is all incorporated. So that looks like very glutinous. It's very sticky. Yes, it's very sticky. Yeah, very, very sticky. But we'll work it out after that when we want to make the bread uh, shape. Now we're going to just have, we just have to cover it. And let it, you know, just you know, rest and rise for the next 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. Just gonna put it in the counter here. And then what are we gonna make next? The next thing I'm gonna make is this a fruit salad. Yeah, fruit salad. With, with the Moroccan touch, and this one is quick, and Yakut's gonna show you. You just been telling me what to do, right? Yes. And it's for this recipe that we need the, the blossom water. So you can choose any fruit you have handy, it doesn't matter, like 
uh, canned fruits, it's okay. And if you wanna have fresh fruits, it's fine too. So in a bowl, I have my fruits in. And instead of sugar, I put condensed milk. Sweet. Which is sweetened. Okay. What? I think condensed milk has sugar in it, I think. Yes, so we don't need extra. Yeah. And, Yakus, can you pour milk in yeah, here? Yeah, can put the milk. Yeah, all of it. Shui, oh, shui. Okay. okay, that's it, that's it. Can you put, can I put that inside? Yeah, can you mix it? Yeah, I can. Sorry. Shui. Okay. So now I'm gonna add the rose water. Okay, not too much because otherwise, if you put too much, it's gonna be a little better, bitter. So it's it's better to put just a little bit for the flavor. <laughs> and it smells good too. You said so rose water. So we mix everything and we let we let it rest. Orange yes. blossom water. <laughs> orange I thought it was or water, yes. orange blossom water. Yes, it's orange blossom water, my mistake. So I mix it and I let it rest until so all the ingredients incorporate. And why I do it first, because the, the fruits release their water and the, the milk become a little um, heavier, if you can say it that way. It's become heavier than what it is right now because all the flavor that's yeah. gonna mixed together so we put it, it aside becomes kind too. of creamy yeah yeah it'll thicken a little bit yeah yeah so now for the chicken tagine so i have different kind of vegetables as i said it's a burger dish it needs a lot of vegetables so i have carrots that i'm gonna cut right now tomato, onion that I chopped. Uh, I have fava beans, some peas, olives. I have parsley that is finely chopped. I have also onion. You don't need it now, just let it. I have tomato that I'm gonna cut too. And I'm gonna show you how we need to cut them. Because the way we're gonna, when, the way we're gonna build the tagine is the way he's gonna look at the end. It's gonna look at the end. So basically, the presentation needs to start from the beginning, how it's gonna look like. So, so you mean, like layer it? What? You, you like make layers? Yes, we need to make layers of, of the vegetables. And no garlic. The garlic is chopped with the onion. Oh, it's uh, garlic and onions. I see it now. Okay. Yeah. So for the potato, let me just move the water. But you said you had peas and beans. They're not cooked. They're still raw, right? Yes. <clears throat> for the potatoes, um, potatoes. Potatoes. So you don't <laughs> use potato skin? No. Everything needs to be peeled and cleaned beforehand. See, my mom always told me that the only nutrition in potato is in the skin. Yeah. When I make that's mashed right. potatoes and potatoes, I use the whole potato. Yeah, but that's right. Many people but, don't. Yeah. I mean, for those kind of dishes, we always remove the peel. Um, we don't cook that much with the peel in, in the tagines. It's just, it's inconvenient because we all eat from the same pot at the end and we eat with bread. It's not something that you put in your plate and you put it on top of rice or anything because we're not a rice country, we are a bread country, we are Mediterranean. So, um, and as I said, we all eat from the same pot. So it's easier when everything is spilled so you don't have, I mean, people are not gonna eat the skin. Yeah. <laughs> so to, to cut the potato, we start by cutting it in half. And then the half cutting it in, in two. And then we're going to keep doing the same thing. Because really you're like baking it in a pot on the top of the stove, right? Yeah, yeah. Finished steaming okay. it. It's sort yeah, of steaming. So what, what, I, 
But today I'm not gonna cook it in the clay pot because it's gonna take a lot of time. I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna cook it in a, a pan, a, a, you know, a deep pan. Could you pressure cook it if you wanted to? Uh, I don't, I, I, I don't advise that because otherwise the, it's gonna be, I mean, you can't, it just, it's not gonna absorb the flavor as it should. I can see. So it's not going to absorb the flavor as it should because basically what we're going to do is we, chicken going to cook fast and also the vegetable because we're going to put everything at the same time. And by not having the heat at a high level, it's going to keep absorbing the flavor. And even the chicken going to be, it's like you marinate it beforehand or you marinate all the vegetables also beforehand, but it's not the case. So this is why. But if you do it in a in a in a pressure cooker, it's fine too. It just it's gonna miss this part of. It'll be have... more like a it'll be more like a stew if you do pressure cook it, probably. No, you can at the end just make it, um, you know, reduce the water and make it more so more saucy. But yeah. but but the problem is it's not gonna absorb the flavor as it should. And uh -huh. it's on a slow cook it, yeah. That's why it's yeah. with it's chicken, you don't really need a pressure cook it with it. It cooks easily. If you're gonna have meat, like beef, I usually start by cooking the meat, like the beef uh, first in the pressure cooker. And one, once it's ready, I reduce the sauce until I have like a thick sauce and then I will add the vegetables apart in a skillet with the meat. But when right. it's chicken, it just, I don't see the meat for it because it's gonna quick, uh, cook quickly. Yeah, if you pressure cook it, uh, all the vegetables are gonna get mushy probably. I mean, if you, if you know the timing of your vegetables it's fine you can cook it in a pressure cooker yeah. and they're not gonna be mushy or anything but the only inconvenient is the flavor i mean it's gonna be still good but it's gonna be missing something yeah so for the next week we cut it that way we can even make it smaller this way it's easier I put everything in this um, so I can add the seasoning. I'm gonna cut all the carrots. Yeah, I really like slow cooking food. Yeah, yeah. Me too. It's, a better, it's a better flavor, a more intensified flavor. I actually already chopped the potatoes and carrots much smaller, but I mean, uh, in the end, it's not really going to matter, right? It's going to cook faster. <laughs> <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. I'm going to... You, you, you want to kind of have the chicken, chicken and the vegetables come out about the same time. Yes, exactly. But in his case, uh, he can start with the chicken and then add the vegetables, like the carrots can put them in the bottom instead of the potatoes and, uh, and layer it in a different way. For the tomatoes, it's gonna be round. Don't tell me you can the tomato squares too. These are like aroma tomatoes. Yes. So I'm gonna put it here. And this is the first so, yeah, I mean, if you chop the vegetables small, you'd probably want to chop the chicken small too. No, so. I don't advise that. I mean, just keep the chicken as it is and he can layer it in a different way. So basically, let me, let me take this away. So basically, I need to turn on the, uh, the oven to warm up. Um, and Suzanne, you can warm up your oven too if you're making the bread. So now for this, I'm gonna put olive oil. 
a generous amount. Like There's a question in the chat. Do you normally buy preserved lemons or do you ever preserve your own? I buy it. But uh, I, it's been a while since I couldn't find it. So now I bought lemon yesterday and I'm planning <laughs> to make it myself. So hopefully it's gonna turn out good. So to talk to Brian, I think he tried, he made it one time and he wants to know if you boil it first or you do straight to salt and lemon juice. So we need to boil it first just because uh, for two reasons. The first reason is when you boil it, it helps release the juice. And also it, kill, it kills any germ or anything that is on the skin of the, the lemon. And then when you boil it, you let it rest a little bit, then you open it like you do, um, you open it from the middle D and, and then you put a lot of salt. And then in the jar, you need to condense all the lemon together so they can start releasing their juice. You don't put any water in it or anything. So that's is, why, and just with the salt and the natural juice of the lemon, you close your jar, you don't open your jar until, I mean, it, it usually takes up to a month or something like that to be really fully cooked. So this, yeah. So this is a lemon pickle. You're basically, when you use lots of salt and water and vegetable, it's a it's pickling. Yes, and it's preserved because it has this salts that make it last for a long time. So I'm putting the parsley here, checking. Now, did you pick the vegetables based on color? Because it looks like you have very diverse colors. When the burger tagine or Moroccan cuisine in general is based on a lot of vegetables. So we, this is like what we are going to make right now is the main dish. But all the time with the main dish, we will have a lot of side dishes or as we call them, cold salads. So you will have like um, eggplant salad that's gonna be a little brown with all the spices. Then you're gonna have like, for example, a kale salad, it's gonna be a dark green because it's steamed and then you're gonna add a lot of spice to it. You're gonna have a carrot salad, which is gonna be orange. Uh, a normal lettuce salad, which is going to have lettuce, tomato, onion, and vinaigrette. So, I mean, the vegetables are colorful. You're going to add vegetables, you're going to have a lot of colors. So, so we're going to, I did parsley and olive oil. I'm going to have ginger, ginger like a big tablespoon, or half a tablespoon, like a small teaspoon. I always have problems with the measurements because it's very different from Morocco, even if it's, I've been here for a long time. But the teaspoons, I mean, one small cup, one whatever it is, and I'm always get confused. But I'm teaspoon, fine. teaspoon, yeah. five, five milliliters is a teaspoon. Yeah, see, I always need to convert to have the right amount. But when it comes to cooking like this, I never measure, it just, we say in Morocco, your eyes is your measurement. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to so put good, a good cooks do it that way. A pinch, a dash. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm going to add salt and the salt depends on how much you like salt. So. You said that salt? Salt, yes. I'm adding salt to it and the amount of salt depends if you like it a little salty just right or less salty, it depends on that. So I'm gonna mix everything. I'm gonna add a little uh, food colorant, which is similar to saffron, and it's pretty common in Morocco. It gives that yellow, orangey color. I'm gonna add a little bit of Water to so you said you don't water. use turmeric because you could get yellow color from turmeric. Yes, I don't have it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I just ran out of it, so I. I just got a bunch from a local farmer. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, there's a the local root. farmer who yeah, grows turmeric and ginger. Wow. Okay. See, it gives that you. River to river farm. That's right. Yes, you can mix it. Yeah, that colors yeah. your potatoes. 
Yeah, it's kind of like the potatoes and it flavors everything. So, so this is the first bench and we're gonna do the rest of the vegetables too, but once we organize this in the pan. So now I'm gonna go and start with the chicken. Let me change the, the setting a little bit. I'm gonna make, uh, I don't know if you see that way. Let me just remove all this from here. I like to have a clean space when I'm cooking. So I'm just removing the extra distraction. Okay. So now to make this, to start with the chicken, and we need the diced, small diced onions. So I'm that onion and garlic. Yeah. Yeah. Onion. Mm -hmm. Chicken and chicken. So Fred, do you think you'll try to make this? I think so. Because yeah. I mean, it's similar to what you cook. You tend to cook regularly. Yeah. No. Just no, a few like different it. spices. Yeah. Are we going to make everything in that frying pan that's on the stove right now? Yes, um, I went to the stove right now. And see, the bright part is this. <laughs> and I'm going to put it in the other side. I don't know if it bothers you guys. If it bothers you, I change the situation. No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Great. It's doing well. Wonderful. So for the, for the chicken, I removed the skin just because this recipe does not require you to broil or to, you know, to bake it in the oven, so no need for the skin. And I'm going to just bring all the, all what I'm going to need in here close by. I'm going to saute your onions and garlic and... Yes. I like, I like that ring light to hold your phone. Yes, yeah. I use it for my videos. Yeah, yeah so she, she actually Not, has nice been enough. doing for at least a couple of years, right? Recording videos and putting on YouTube. Yeah, I started yeah. like five years ago, I believe, and I stopped for a while because I went back again to college. And, and, um, and after that, it was just hectic with work and everything so I stopped and then I started again last summer when I mean when I had the baby and with the coronavirus thing and I was just um I needed something for me and I was like let's go back and do it again so I yeah, put I mean, some you have a lot of a lot you know I how many a... videos you have on YouTube you have lots of them I believe before I stopped a few years ago, I had around 75 or something. And now maybe I have 90. And can you put her links, a uh, link in uh, the chat or? Sure. <clears throat> so I'm reheating the, the olive oil a little bit. I'm going to add. The Are you thinking you what kind of olive oil? Yeah. What was the second oil? You had olive oil and, and something else. No, just the olive oil. I oh, had all olive oil. Oil. Okay. All right. You can, mix it. you can mix it. I'm gonna make your brother's uh, milk. Milk. So like that's yeah. Really that, yeah. That light really makes it so it's really nice to <laughs> nice uniform. Yeah. yeah. I mean, bright. these cameras and the phone and stuff are really great cameras, but they require a lot of light for good shots. That's the problem we have in Zoom. If you don't have enough light, it gets, you know, it just doesn't, isn't very sharp. Fred, there's her YouTube channel. Thank you. I'll have to ask her. She's got a Facebook page. How to, It's in French, how to say it. How do you say your uh, Facebook page? Yeah, it's the same as the channel. It's called Les Bons, Les Bons Petits Plats, which means the little delicious dishes. The little yeah. plate, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to just save it in the chat. Save the chat.
I knew because it's French, I knew I would mangle it. I had a, a friend from France that she said I could never say her name right. And we're still <laughs> friends, but I have a friend from Colombia who can't say my name right. So don't worry, pronouncing names correctly is I was just gonna say you and Howard are kindred spirits in that department. <laughs> You're doing a good job of spitting up. Oh, I said it and then she stopped stirring it. <laughs> Is that that's just garlic and onions? Yeah, garlic and onion. Let me love it. So. so I'm doing a big I'm gonna I'm just going to split the onion for one reason. It was, the onion was cut for two portions and I just put everything in the same pan <laughs> and I needed to divide it. Okay. How can I keep on mixing it? Okay. On Give me one second. Okay. Oh, man. So now that I'm, you know, I'm mixing the... We need smell-o-vision. Yeah. What? Mine smells good, but it does not look good. It's been slow cooking for about an hour. Okay, so now I'm going to add the chicken again. Cut it even oh, smaller if you want, but not small spread. Like, don't dice this it. Is a, this is a leg and a thigh. Yes. So I'm going to add parsley. Parsley. And I'm going to add all the spices that I added for the fish. So I'm gonna so you, you, do you take the skin and the fat off? For me, that's the best flavors. I remove the skin because this dish is not going to be, you know, the chicken is not going to be broiled or it's, gonna, it's not going to be baked. In the it's oven. not going to crisp. The skin's not going to get crispy in this. Yeah, so the skin gonna be, I mean, you're not going to like the skin at the end in the dish. I promise you. It's not yeah, going to be crisp. Yeah. So we just kind of got gooey skin. Yes. A little bit of stew. And the saffron or turmeric. Can I see that jar? Oh, well, you this one, it's, it's, it does not, uh, the, the coloring, uh, food coloring that I have, it's not that one. That's why it's just so a jar of paprika that I poured the, the color in. I poured it in the jar of paprika. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're like me. You buy the spice in a big bag and then you reuse containers. Exactly. You Except you don't buy saffron in a big bag. <laughs> no, you don't buy saffron in a big bag. <laughs> Too expensive. <laughs> Traditional saffron, other than being expensive, it's, you don't find you don't find the real one that often. It's mostly yeah. A lot they, of cultures, including Mexico, they use some coloring in place of saffron because it's so expensive. No, and the problem is you don't find a real saffron. It's always you know mixed with something that is not good for you. And I mean, I saw a lot of documentaries talking about how they um, right. Yeah, it says it's, yeah, it says it's saffron, but it's always salt and a bunch of other stuff on a little saffron. Exactly. If it does not come from Morocco, it's because we have farms, saffron farms in Morocco. Farms? In Spain, they have saffron too. Yeah, they but, probably ex and I, I assume Morocco exports a lot probably. Uh, for sure. So I'm gonna keep salting the chicken <clears throat> and through the sauteing process, the chicken gonna start releasing the water. So for this dish, we're not gonna put a lot of water because the chicken gonna release the water, the vegetables gonna release the water. And if we add water, a lot of water to it, it's gonna be too soggy and we're gonna wait a lot to wait for the water to reduce basically and simmer. Good so point. we're gonna just, yeah. And we just so started gonna, cooking and I'm hungry. Oh, L luckily I started so mine an hour ago so mine you're is gonna, mine is you're going to put a lid on it 
or um in this me method is a little bit close to my hometown method when they start sauteing everything and before adding the vegetables with the onions and you know as you see it right now because a traditional berber tagine they would put everything in the middle bit of the tagine and then pour the sauce from the top and just let it cook as it is and then the flavor will embrace each other in my hometown we love onions and we love sauteing everything in onions so basically, that way you're gonna have like a caramelized sauce at the end, a little more thicker sauce. Because the berber tagine, basically, what they end up having is like less sauce and more. It's just the meat and vegetable cooked, and the sauce is very reduced. Sometimes you have the meat that that's glued to the bottom of your pan or your traditional tagine. Yeah, and the caramelization will make it a little sweeter too. Yes. <clears throat> Now what, because normally what I should have done, I should have marinated the chicken at least 24 hours before, minimum two hours prior to cooking it. How I marinated, I put salt, uh, a little pepper, parsley, and a lot of ginger, and lemon, a squeezed lemon. And I marinate everything and I let it rest and absorb the flavors. Now, since we did not do that, and um, this is why I want to saute the chicken a little bit and let it absorb the flavors before I add anything else. I'm going to also right now add a squeezed lemon because normally this, this dish has like a little bit of um, preserved lemon that I don't have. So they don't bring this anymore. So I'm going to add a squeezed lemon. Lemon or lime, it's fine. One of them. One of them. Because I'm gonna cut it into a little way to do it. It's gonna help the chicken to cook faster and it's gonna inhale of the flavor too. Just half of a lime. It needs to be in a low heat on a low heat to help the flavors absorb. And we can add like small holes to the chicken so the sauce would penetrate the meat. Are there many vegetarians in Morocco that you know of? None that I'm aware of actually. <laughs> no. I mean, for sure there is, but it's not something common that we talk about. And honestly, I've been away from Morocco for the past eight years. And I know that it's changed a lot. And I mean, my sister told me that if, when you're going to come back to visit, it's going to be very like a new culture shock for you, even if it's your country. A lot of things have changed and people changed, mentalities have changed. So I don't know, maybe there is people who are vegetarian now. I don't know. Yeah, and your friends are going to say you speak with an American accent. Who knows, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so now that, you know, I sauteed the chicken, I think it absorbed the flavors enough. Uh, I'm going to start adding vegetables. Now, it's better to put the carrots in the bottom. Simple reason, simple fact. Carrots are gonna cook for a longer time because it's harder. And when you put it in the bottom, it's covered by the other vegetables, so it creates more steam for it. Okay? And so the I'm carrots will caramelize more if they're on the bottom. Two, yes. And it's gonna give a lot of sugar in a carrot. Other sweet, sweetness and carrots. But don't worry, it's not gonna burn because we're gonna add a little bit of water and everything. I mean, all the vegetables gonna release the water too. I'm using my hands because this is what I we do in Morocco. Yeah. And don't worry, I wash my hands a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but you we also trusted. said at the end everybody eats from the same pot. 
and their everybody hand. Needs to with use, their hands. Yeah, <laughs> using their hands, but everybody needs to wash their hands first, and everybody needs to eat from his their side. I mean, you cannot eat from my side. My side, it's my side. Go to the, I mean, the side is your side. If, if, for example, you don't have carrots left in your side, I mean, you need to accept it. Unless it's your mom, I mean, like your mom, like, mom, please, one more carrots from your side, or something like That's that. That's what I do. But uh, other than that, yes, everybody is from his side. And if something that you have in your side is done, then you have to deal with it. So I'm adding the vegetables that way. That looks yummy. So yes. that alone is causing the chicken to kind of steam underneath there. Yes. <laughs> sort of like making a lid. I like to put the tomatoes in the middle. And I'm adding the rest of the potatoes. Yeah, I've made something similar to this, but with uh, Italian spices instead of, and then just put it in the slow cooker and let it slow cook for like a couple hours. Yeah, I might try this in my Instapot. I'm kind of curious how it'll turn out. What, you're going to try to do it? You're going to try to break tradition and do it in like three minutes? Well, it's not about just three minutes. It's just I'm experimenting with my Instapot of what I can do in it. Well, the thing is with the Instapot, at the end, of, of, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of water. And you well, can... that's true. It's got, like you said, it's going to be more like a stew. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to reduce the water. I know that there is an option that helps to reduce the water. You open the lid and you let it bring yeah. it So now yeah, the... I add the onions to the same sauce. I have sauce left in the bottom of my um, my thing. <laughs> and I'm adding the rest of the vegetables. You can add zucchini to it. Or you can add green pepper, red pepper, whatever you want. Yeah. So I'm mixing everything again. And Is there any gonna, vegetable you wouldn't use? Uh, I would. I would not use um, banana squash. I wouldn't. It's gonna be too soggy. I would not use sweet potatoes because it's gonna be too sweet. I would not use um, kale, spinach, things like that. Because they would just disappear. Yes, yeah, so basically no, there's no there's no vegetables that are very wet and vegetables really strong flavored. Right. You wouldn't so use So I did my fava beans on top, like you can see. So my oh. olives. Those ones are not cooked beans. No. But they're fresh. They're frozen, they're frozen but not cooked. Frozen, yeah. Okay. Yeah, these are got, dried. These are dried. Mean, bean. Lava bean is more like a pea, right? It cooks quick. Yeah, but it's not a dried bean. It's not a dried bean, you know. It's like a fresh one, a little bit. It's, it's like fresh frozen. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna add a little some peas. Okay. And now. Wow. And uh, basically, you can see snow. Yes. My fingers are yellow. I don't know if you can see that. Uh -huh. But it's yeah. fine. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to add water. I do not pour the water on top because I don't want the color to fade. So I'm going to pour down, it from the side. the side. But just a little bit, as I said, because when we're going to cover it, the natural release of the water from the vegetables and the chicken gonna start and you're gonna end up having more water. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is how you're gonna make your <coughs> make your steam. So I'm gonna put the lid on. Yeah. I'm gonna do yeah. the same thing for my other portion. I have another pan going on here. I wanna I wanna put the same, I'm gonna put the same thing and saute everything and add the vegetables. I didn't set anything. 
I did not. I heard you just some things with. And there's something so are you about just making the same thing in two pots? Yes, I'm using another pot. I'm making another portion for a friend. <laughs> That's my impression. I'm going to put in the ingredients. Can I have some wine? Can I have some wine? Wait a second. Okay. You, if you, you have say, any could she have some wine? <laughs> she wants wine. No, and she said wine. Wanna add. The rest of the sauce that you have here, do not throw it. You can add it to your pot. It gives, it gives extra flavor and it has it even more. But you didn't add, you didn't add any moisture in. Well, you are now. No, I added some water, and now I am adding half of the sauce left in here. I mean, you can add it all. I'm just gonna add half because I'm gonna add the other half in the other portion. See, I'm repeating the same thing uh, in here. So I'm sauteing this. I'm gonna increase the heat a little bit. I'm repeating the same thing. If you have any question about anything else, you can ask me. I'm just repeating what I just did with you. Mm -hmm. So for the tagine one, I just remembered something that I forgot to tell you. Once I finish with this, I will explain it. Do you you know how do you, they, go ahead. Do you ever do the whole chicken in there or it's always cut up? I mean, for this specific kind of tagine, it's better to be cut out than having a whole chicken. For other dishes in Moroccan cuisine, yes, we have a lot of dishes that we keep the chicken as it is. We don't cut it. Now, is there any other meats you do the same dish with? Yes, with, with beef or lamb. Beef. Just for the lamb part, I I will cook the lamb first or the beef first in a pressure cooker. And when it's cooked, then I will add the vegetables in the clay pot or in the pan. Just because it's gonna take a long time and it will, it will take you, um, I mean, you will need to watch it for a long time. Watch if the water is still in there and if it's still cooking to prevent to burn it. So this is why I advise to start with, uh, to cook the meat first the beef or lamb in a pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask a question and see if you're going to get it. Um, so in the clay pot tagine that I showed you, so normally there is a lid in a clay pot tagine. So what do you think about how Berbers or how people of Morocco in general know when a tagine, the clay pot tagine is missing water and needs more water. Otherwise it's gonna burn. Well, it also don't. It, there won't be water vapor coming out of the top of it, and then you know that there's no not enough water. So, so the no. you're talking about the one with the little chimney. Yes. So the moisture would be coming out of the chimney, no? No, it does not come out of, from the top. But oh. there, is, there is something that if it happens, there's like a trick that they use. If it happens, it means that it means that it's missing water, and if you don't add water, it's gonna burn. So if it starts burning, then when you hear the smoke detector goes off, then it's time to add more water. <laughs> it's perfect. I think it's too late by then. I do the same yeah. thing. It's fine. <laughs> But, or I don't know if you can show the um, pictures of a tagine from the slide. 
All right, let me find it again. Do I still? Yep, I still have it stuck. The lid sets inside, obviously, of the bottom part. So, does the does the lid rattle? That's a good idea, maybe. All right, can you guys see that? Okay, so let's see the the bottom machine. So, what do you see from the left? How do they look for you? Oh, it's got the like the little lip, so the there would be moisture around the lip. It'll create a seal there, and if there's no water, there won't be a seal. Well, the shape of the lid helps, you know, circulate the steam. Yeah, it comes up and it condenses and then runs back down into the pan. On the outside? No. No, on the inside. Oh, yeah. It's sort of refluxing in chemistry. We would call that a, like a reflux where the well, if that's moisture the case, comes then up. It never needs any extra water if the water just yeah. cycles. Well, that's right. It well, sort of condenses and runs down. All of it condenses. Uh, Some will go out the chimney. Never needs water. So the, the chimney is not open. Oh, it's oh, not. that's even better then. The water all stays inside. Yeah. Let me tell you what. Well, if you if you cooked it too fast, the the lid would start to rattle a little bit because of pressure. Mm. And I mean, it's clay. Wouldn't it, the clay absorb? You know, a moisture. A certain amount, but not that much. I mean, that's now, why if you want to. Yeah, if it doesn't have a chimney, well. then you would see the lid would start to rattle a little bit at, from pressure, be releasing pressure. Well, you all missed it, but let me explain. <laughs> we, we thought we were all being smart. I well, know. I got the closest <laughs> correct, right? <laughs> so let's see. So this is a clay pot. This is a traditional tagine, right? So this is the lid, as I told you. It is. So See, there isn't a chimney. It's closed no. from here. There is nothing that can come out. That's true when it's cooking. There is some water that comes from the side because, you know, the water leaves from the vegetables and things like that. But when it starts, you know, lacking water, yeah. and how can you know that so it cannot burn? Oh, it's the color of the lid. Oh, no. What's that? So the, the, the top of the lid has... Um, a hole and this hole is made on purpose so basically you put water in it and when there is no water left because there is other leads who are larger than this and you can secure i mean in a clear way so when there is no water left it means the tajin is lacking water and you need to add more so it starts ah. sucking water into the little pinhole no it yeah. just starts it evaporates basically there is a it pinhole just, no, I don't think so. Well, oh. that's a really small there hole to no, add extra no, water inside. Oh, there then. is no hole. So it just, on no the top, hole, but it just boils away because it gets hot. Ah. Yeah, it, it, it evaporates. So basically, yeah. this hole is a little deep and it's a little, you know, even bigger. It's, it reaches here. That conducted heat evaporates that yeah. water. Yeah, so when the water is evaporated and there is no water, it means it's all evaporated and your tagine is lacking water and you need to add more. Otherwise, it's going to stick to the bottom of your clay pot and burn. burn. But, you know, a lot of Berber friends that I have, they like when it sticks a little bit, the, the meat sticks a little bit to the bottom. It gives an enhanced flavor and I believe that too because I do it. Also, my mother-in-law don't like it. Don't tell her. That I mean. She's like, no, it's burnt stuff. It's not good. And she's right. I mean, she's right. But, you know, it just, it's the way it makes that tagine more rich in flavor because it concentrates. So you know, people it's... like it a little crispy anyway. Yes. It yeah. makes the meat a little crispy, especially if you make it with beef or lamb. Yeah. Well, our tagine is cooking right now, and I believe it's been half an hour since we let the, the dough rest for the bread. I, yeah. I have a question for you. Yeah, I, I, I noticed you got turmeric on your hand. Like, how do you get yellow off of your hand? Don't worry, I'm going to wash it with soap two, three times, and it's going to fade through the time. Yeah, because yeah. whenever I get turmeric on my hands, I never can get it off. Yeah, well, real real cooks don't worry about that. 
it's like me. it's like fountain pen people get ink on their fingers that's just the nature of the hobby <laughs> so basically what i'm gonna do now i have my pen that's gonna go to the oven yeah, yeah. The there is people who likes to put flour on top of your working space i hate flour on my hands it just i don't like the texture I don't like it. So this is why I have fine semolina that I'm gonna use instead. So I'm gonna just sprinkle. Yeah, so this is the grain, but it's not ground. It's very thin semolina, very Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. So I'm gonna take my <laughs> She is a good helper. <laughs> good helper. You can see it's raised from. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I'm going to have a bowl with a little bit of water to help me manage the dough and not stick to my hands. A bowl with a little bit of water. And I'm going to just put this in my hands. And I'm going to just dip my hand in that bowl a little yeah. bit. Won't Rub stick it to your hand. Yeah. Yeah. And start, you know. Put in the dough on top of here. Man, that, that dough is amazingly sticky. I it's know. Like very stretchy. It is. That's right. Let me grab a, a knife. Well, let me stretch it first. Okay. So now I'm gonna just add more semolina on top of it. It's gonna help me manage the dough. Just I'm gonna put it in the edges. Don't worry to put a little too much. It's just gonna help to work the dough and make it easier to roll. See, so I'm, done. I'm putting semolina all over it. You can put the fl flour instead. You can use flour. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, you can use it. You can definitely use flour. So now I'm gonna start stretching. Wait a second, I'm stretching it. I'm just gonna cut it to make it stretch in here. So I'm having more space. Then do the same with this. Roll it like that. And he is quick. Bam, 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 bam. So now I'm going to cut basically the yeah. dough. How can you even cut dough? I'm going to add my, the fine semolina on my tray. oven tray. Yeah, and you already said earlier you're not going to do a bunch of kneading of the dough. No, yes. Yeah, so this is why I'm not doing it, but I have this the tray that's going to go to the oven. So I put a little some it's a circle in. tray. Yes, I, I, it's yeah. <laughs> it is. A I noticed that in Africa and Middle Eastern countries, there's a lot of circle um, cook, yes. um, serving trays and baking trays. But in the U.S., everything is yeah. square. Well, this one uh, somebody got it from the U.S. and I just inherited it from somebody that left. But if I you wonder... go to uh, if you go to um, uh, Arabic store in Chicago, something like that, there is a lot of them. I wonder if some of the old ovens, outdoor ovens, were round, and so maybe a round thing was better. That's true. The old, old wood-fired and yeah, like you know, pizza beehive ovens. ovens. Yeah, yeah, they're round. Or think, think about how you eat, and then you understand the serving dishes. If you're oh. eating communally and everybody is sitting around a plate and sharing, right. round, sure. round, round makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Yes, that's true. I yes, I forgot that part. That's true. Yeah. We have to be our tables are round, and we sit around the table, so everything is to be round because it needs to fit the shape of the table. In, in the square, square, you only got four sides. The table, but the table is square. Yeah, you <laughs> might have four sides and eight people. But <laughs> yeah. in most American households, you're not eating from the communal tray. You're That's taking right. from the communal tray and putting it onto That's your right. plate. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. 
when in Morocco it's pretty different. And when we have like square shaped um, dining tables and things like that, it's very hard to manage because when you put the dish, the main dish in the middle of the table, imagine the ones that are in the side, it's very hard. Some for person's to further away than somebody else. Yes. Yeah, I yeah, mean, I rectangular tables are probably left over from the kings, right? So it's hi hierarchical. Probably. It's a different eating style, uh, whether it's plated or communal. That's all. Think about going to a Chinese restaurant with the lazy Susan. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, you know, there are many countries in the world where you eat sitting on the floor. Many countries. Korean barbecue. Korean barbecue. Like okay, so the, the tray is ready. I'm gonna just wash my hands and put it nice. in the oven. Nice. Me too. I like the I like not kneading the bread a bunch a lot. Yeah, I mean she didn't even use like a mixer. I mean she just like mixed it together and the just, spoon, yeah. I mean barely mixed it. Yeah. And just let the yeast what set for about 30 minutes. Well, I'm thinking of uh, sort of North African too, having you think of uh, having a flat bread, like a pita or something as a daily kind of bread. No, actually in North of Morocco, North of Africa, I mean, the main bread is basically that thick and it's still gonna rise in the oven and we're gonna have a lot of, I mean, it's gonna be thick and- Was that some um, of the French influence that uh, that you, they have the more uh, uh, bread that's rising rather than a flat bread? No, I, I mean, even the Moroccan traditional bread is the same way. It rises wow. and more, it's thicker because we want the, because we dip it in the sauce and we need so you, it to absorb it. Yeah, it you should it, absorb and you want like a pocket to <laughs> scoop food, right? Yeah. Yeah, if it was that thin, you, you cannot absorb the sauce. Right, you need more substantial bread. I get it, yeah. Well, I'm gonna clean uh, at the same time, talk to you, uh, but I'm gonna show you how the tagine is doing. Because I need you to see how much water it's released. Okay? See? Oh, wow. Really you didn't really yeah. put much moisture in. But do, no, you, uh, do you let it, uh, do you reduce that moisture by letting it cook or not? I mean, I let it cook and once the, the vegetables are ready and the meat is ready, I can remove the lid and let it reduce a little bit more. Okay. But right at the end, you let the moisture out, yeah? Yes. Yes. Right at the end. Right now, I'm just going to clean at the same time, talk to you. Yeah. And if you have any questions, go ahead. It's now or maybe never. <laughs> just, uh... Well, this has been wonderful. It really is wonderful. You did such a great job. Well, thank you. I'm glad you like it. Well, this is a very But this dish. is not a modern cooking show. Modern cooking show, you'd put it on the stove and then you'd take one out and eat the show right away. <laughs> yeah, the modern show, the real only got, show. In the modern show, they only got like 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not with Ray yet, but you know, we never know. <laughs> This is how she started out. Yes, I know. Everybody start someplace. Somewhere, that's right. Mom. Yes, Mama. Yes. The computer. Yes. Is there any spices that you remember from Morocco that you can't get here now? You, it's hard. Uh, you said olives already. Olives. Uh, I don't know if. You, I have a friend who has access to restaurant depot and they have this big um, bag of Moroccan olives, black olives. And it's the same as Morocco or you can find it if you go to a butcher in Chicago that sells uh, halal meat. I don't know if you are familiar with halal meat. If you want me to yeah. explain it again. Yeah, it's like a, it's the Muslim version of kosher. 
Yes, it's this. Yes, I mean, Muslim and Jewish people eat the same way. It needs to be yeah. halal. It needs to be slaughtered in a certain way, right. and we can eat each other meat because we know it's slaughtered the right way. And basically, um, those kind of stores that sells halal meat have a bunch of vegetables that are from my home country or from other seas overseas and also you can find moroccan olives palestinian olives turkish olives and the moroccan black olives specifically even when i buy it in morocco i will have to wash it to release the extra salt and once i do that i put it in a tray and turn first on the oven um, and when the oven is very hot i know when the, the oven is very hot, then what I do is I put the tray inside the, the oven to let it dry out a little bit. When they dry out a little bit, they give better flavor and they're less watery. You feel like the olive lost the extra moisture and the flavor was enhanced, basically. It's a stronger olive flavor. And then once I do that, I just put it in, put them in a jar and I add a little bit of olive oil. It's just like I wrap them in olive oil and I shake the jar and I keep them in my um, kitchen. <laughs> That's it. So uh, otherwise spices you can find, yeah? The spices, yes, the spices. There is a spice that's called the Ras al Hanut which is the, the exact translation is the top of the market. It's like the top of the market spices. And it's like a mix of 15 spices like that. It can go up to 25 spices. Um, and it's a little similar to garam, garam masala, but it's not quite the same taste. And it's very hard for me to find it here. The problem is when some, I mean, I have some of my family who came to visit a few years ago. They brought me some, but the problem with the spices is they fade through the time and you don't have the same enhanced and strong flavor. And so basically I felt like it, it's not giving me what I needed from the spice. So, and it's hard for me to find it here. Wow. I did find something similar, and it's also called the top of the market spice, something the same name and everything. But it does not taste the same. It's it's really far away from what it should be tasting. So this is the one spice that I really, really had a hard time finding. And even if you buy it from Amazon, it's the same problem. It has a lot of... Um, there is a specific, uh, how they call it? I forgot the name in English. Clou um, Giro. Let me Brian, check. Did name. you have a question? Yeah. So um, on Ras Al Hanoud, I'll just chime in. I think part of the problem is every shop has a different blend, and most of the commercial ones. Um, use more of the cheap spices and less of the more expensive ones. <clears throat> and each brand is gonna have a really different flavor. Uh, I, I experienced that just going from house to house when I was staying with, with um, locals, is that their Ras Al Hanout blends, they only liked it from one spice shop. And each shop had a like different flavor. like choice of spices, yeah? Yeah, and they were all a little different from one another. Um, but uh, one of my uh, hosts asked me to teach them an American recipe. And I pulled the recipe from the internet, translated it into French, translated the measurements into metric and weight, figured out the right flour, where to <laughs> buy all the ingredients. But then when we got to his sister's kitchen, she didn't own any measuring cups or any measuring spoons. So I said, okay, that's fine. I know the weights. Where's your scale? And she laughed and she said, what would I need a scale for? Um, 
and so I said, all right, where do we get these? Will your neighbor have one? And she said, no, nobody I know has these things. <laughs> I like and, her style. And this was a very large house, probably close to 5,000 square feet with an enormous kitchen, but no measuring cups, no measuring spoons. No Did spoons. they have a cook? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think she had a cook because um, another meal she prepared for us, um, a big fancy meal with, with my host making the vegetable tagine, but she what made a, 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 uh, she made a fish pastilla and a fresh bread, and then we had a, a vegetable tagine. Um, but I'm guessing it's common to cook by eye and by hand and by touch and not by measuring. Yeah. Oh, we lost your sound. You're... You got muted. Do you know how we measure things in Morocco? <laughs> Let me show you, wait a second. With your eyes. <laughs> I'm gonna grab it, wait a second. There's a reason it's called a pinch because when you have something in the palm of your hand and you take a pinch, that's a pinch. I thought it was called a pinch because when you don't have any scales and you don't have any measuring cups and you're in a pinch, you just use Oh, a pinch. it's because you put the spice in your hand and you take a pinch between your thumb and your finger and that's a pinch. You're using just a, a glass. A that's most glass. of what I do. So, so basically this is a tikka. Okay. That's what I ended up using is a teacup. Yeah. <laughs> now the teacup is our, our you know, uh, measuring cup. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're gonna make a cake, for example, if somebody asks you how to make a cake, they're gonna tell you uh, three cups of flowers. Well, you're gonna take the yogurt cup. You're gonna pour the yogurt cup. And with that yogurt cup, you're gonna measure all the rest. If you pour your, your yogurt in this cup, so then you're gonna measure with this cup. So let's let's say that you, you poured one one teacup of yogurt. So you're gonna have tea cups of the same amount of flour, a half of it for oil and, and the rest of the ingredients. And it's the same way when like I ask my mom about um, a specific traditional Ramadan recipe. And I don't know if you know what's Ramadan. Ramadan is when Muslim have one month in the Islamic year and they fast from sunrise to sunset, no food, no water. So we have like specific food that we make during that month to help us like energize after we break our fasting during the sunset. And when I asked my mom about the recipe a few years ago, she was like, take a cup of tea. You will need this amount of flour, like this amount of cup of tea, like three cup of teas and one of oil and one you make, one you will need to have three quarter of it with olive oil, three quarter of it, one quarter of it with olive oil, one quarter of it with butter, another quarter with normal oil and mix all of it and it needs to be one cup of this cup. Of this. So it's basically, you need to take it as a reference in everything you need to make in when it comes to pastry and dough and flour. But when it comes to making tagines and things like that, it's basically depends on eye measurements and how you see things and there is no specific amount like salt you it depends on how much salt you like in your food if you like it's most saltier or a little less salt yeah the, Amer the americans would take the cup and then they would make a little mark half a cup a quarter of a cup <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know people that even for making sweets, they don't need to measure anything. They they have the right, you know, measurements from the first time. I, I struggle making pastry and sweets just because I need to measure everything. I'm more at um, size. I, I would just see things and know how much approximately I would need. But when it comes to cakes and things that need precise amount of ingredients, I, I have, I struggle actually. I have a hard time to do it. Yeah, my father, uh, I grew up in the restaurant business. My father cooked his whole life. I don't think he ever used any roll measuring cups. He just, he just knew what to do. <laughs> Dinner's ready. Change the camera. 
What was that? I don't know. How's yours, Masaru, coming out? So I'm gonna just pop the chicken and check. I haven't. Everything is. Anything. Or I think you're the only one following along with the cooking recipes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as you can see, I don't know if you can see that, but the chicken is getting very tender. See? Yeah. <laughs> so it's almost, I mean, I think it's cooked, actually. The potatoes are cooked, too. The carrots, they're cooked. So now what I'm going to do is just remove the lid and let the sauce reduce. Meanwhile, the fruit salad is in the fridge to cool off, to cool down a little bit. And the bread is cooking. I'm going to just increase the heat a little bit to have the sauce reduce faster. I'm going to ch just check on the other pan. It is sick. How long is the bread in the oven? I didn't catch that. Well, the bread is going to take between 20 minutes to 25 minutes. Mm. Maximum. Even the other pan, the chicken is cooked. And I'm going to remove the lid too to help the sauce reduce. I'm the table. Oh, yeah. 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 See, I always, I always make snacks to eat while I'm cooking because... <laughs> I don't actually... Uh, I don't try my food and it's rare that I have some snacks to, to eat. It just... If I, it's something that I really miss and I didn't make in a long time, maybe I would just start <laughs> taking some while cooking, just tasting some. But in general, I never taste my food. I never check the salt. Uh, and it's always on point, usually. And I uh, always... What? The ingredients. Wait a minute. Why are you not tasting the food as you're cooking? I don't like that. I do. And because I have another way to do it without tasting. Oh, well, yeah. She does it for you. That's good. Well, <laughs> no, she does not. <laughs> She's just joking. Uh, but what I do, basically, I have another technique that helps me know what spices is, what spice is missing and what I need to add to my dish. And I don't know if you heard that um, there is people who can smell the spices and know what kind of spice is missing. What? So basically what I do is just I get close and smell. And if I smell like there is not much cumin or not much paprika or it does not smell enough salt, I just add it. Wait, you can smell salt? Yes. That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I smell the spices. I can smell when it's salt. Just the smell the smell of the final ingredient, the final dish smells different when there is less salt than when you have the right amount. I couldn't even smell cumin. That's a completely different level of cooking when you can smell how much salt there is with just your nose. See, oh, you, I mean, <laughs> you smell with your mouth open, so it hits the, the the taste buds in the back of your mouth. Yes, but the food also has to be inside my mouth for me to taste how much salt there is. So like this one, I just smelt the other portion. This one is perfect, the right amount of salt, and I hope it is. But I'm like ninety five percent confident. So. I want to be like the pizza smell. It just, uh, I, uh, my mom was always fighting with me. She was like, taste the food, taste the food. I'm like, no, I hate tasting the food. I, I like your mom already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, I will taste it when it's on, you know, on the table, when we're going to be all together. Yeah. But other than that, I just cannot taste the food when it's cooking. 
first of all, there is another reason. When the food is very hot, you cannot taste the real degree of each spice. So you cannot really know if it's salty or it's lacking, I don't know, paprika or it's lacking coriander or it's lacking, you know, cumin or whatever. Because it's too hot, the flavors are, are not distinguished. By yeah. the, but once it's, once it's a little warm, you can start noticing which spice is, you know, is missing or which spice we need to add a little bit. <coughs> but, but for me, I mean, in general, I just smell and evaluate Wait. on the smell if something is missing. Can you show us how the fruit salad looks after it sets? Because you said the milk would thicken up. It will thicken up. You yeah. put, but you put condensed milk in there, and so it's drawing the, the juices of the fruit out, but then it thickens. <laughs> yeah, it creates like a syrup that thickens the milk. I tasted it. And, and, and basically, if, if you have not, I mean, real... If you cut fruits that are not, you know, canned fruits, it's going to release even more syrup. Mm -hmm. Let me fix it. I mean, I don't know if you can. So now I mean, the milk good. is all flavored with the juices, yeah. Yes. Um, I tasted it. It was good. So there's no sugar. It was just condensed milk and fruit cut up and then a little bit of orange blossom. Water. Water. Let me give you a small one. Okay. Your, your, your sample tester is going to test it, huh? See. Yeah. I know it's good. By taste, not only by smell. <laughs> I mean, it smells orange blossom water. You can yeah. smell it. So is there any fruit you wouldn't put in there? Like may like I probably wouldn't put dates in or raisins. Right, yeah. You can put raisins, it's fine. But what I like to put, I, I will not put, put like um, kiwis. No kiwis. It does not mix well with the other fruits. It become a little um, sour. And the taste turns really bad with the milk. I don't know why. And the blossom water. So, um, so normally so like I citrus, put... citrus and apples. How about banana? Banana is my favorite. So I always put banana. Okay. <laughs> so there is a banana, apples, uh, mandarins or orange cut in small pieces. I will put um, uh, pineapple, peaches, mango, strawberries. Strawberries, uh, I mean, they mix very well with the bananas and apple. Um, I, got, yeah. I got a message from somebody said they're going to use that roasting the whole olives on high heat trick. Like how you said to do that with the olives. I turn off the oven before putting the olives inside. Uh, so I mean, you bring them at high be... heat, and then you put them in, and then you turn it off. Yes. Okay. To so just dry them out. Yes. And okay. I repeat this. I mean, I leave them inside until the oven cools down. And then I repeat that two to three times, depends on how, I mean, how much time I need to repeat that. So do I mean, you take the olives out, heat the oven up, and then put them back in? Yes. Okay. I do that two to three times. Depends on how big are the olives and how much time I need to repeat of food. I mean, I've dehydrated yeah. stuff. I have a gas oven, so it has just a little flame. No, I don't want to dehydrate it because the, with the dehydration, basically, most of the time, it's going to just dry too much, and it's going to be a little hard. We don't want that. We want it to stay soft. Okay. And it, yes, it's going to dehydrate a little bit, but not to the point where it's very dry and hard to chew on. Yeah, so you're just taking the moisture, but you don't want the olive itself to dehydrate. 
Yes, we take yeah. a yes, we take the moisture, but not one hundred percent. Let's say we take like fifty percent. You know, your olive become wrinkly, but it's still very soft, and you can squeeze it, and it's, it's still manageable. Good deal. Yes, I, I agree. Let me check on the bread. Let me put this, see if you can see the oven with me. Let me grab them. See, it's puffing up, it's cooking, it's good. It's rising. So it's good, we are in a good spot, it's cooking. <laughs> and the chicken yeah. is ready, actually. Really. And it's, and it's so beautiful and colorful, the chicken. Yes, it is. Let me show but you. You said you, you let it cool down before you serve it. No, you can eat it as it is, but it's too hot. You just, you know, um, you can eat it. I mean, what we do is once it's very hot like that, we put it on the table and we start eating. It's going to cool down through the process of eating. Right, but you, you said you don't eat it like over rice. You just get bread and you like eat it with the bread. So it doesn't... Yes, so do you, right now, you rip right off now a we... piece of bread and you use the bread to like grab a piece so you don't burn your hand? No, let me show you. So this is because, bread. I mean, a, a small piece yeah. like this. I mean, we don't... <laughs> It's still sizzling in here, but basically we're gonna put it on the table and sit around, gonna eat salads and then start with the tagine. After that, we don't jump straight into the tagine. So it's gonna be a little cooler as when that gets hot. So, so what you we need do a lot is, of side stuff first. Yes, we start with, no, wait a second. Fine. She wanna start, okay, go ahead. <laughs> From here. 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 Put him, put him here. She hacked it. So basically, we're gonna dip the bread into the sauce like this. You see, the bread is full of sauce. We can cut, we cut the vegetables also with the bread, and and we pull it like this. We need to eat with our right hand, so we hold it like this. And we, uh, we eat have it. we have one vegetarian on here. I think you could do this same dish without the chicken, with the same spices. But yes. you would have to add probably a little more oil because you don't have the so much moisture of the chicken. Mm, it's not oil problem. You can add more vegetables to make it more consistent. Oh. But the oil, I mean, as I added at the beginning, I add like half a, uh, a cup. Did you um, notice that the U.S. chicken has a lot more moisture in it? Like here, the pro how they process the chicken, mm -hmm. they you know cut it up and then they soak it in water so it soaks water and then they, you know, so it, it yes, you're right. chicken in the U.S. has a lot more moisture in it than other countries. I feel that's right. I noticed that when I used to buy from normal grocery stores. Um, lately, I started buying from halal butcher. When I travel, I would buy big amount and just come and freeze it. So when it's, and basically they do not soak it in water. I mean, it's made really kosher halal way. So basically it's cut in a certain way. They, they grab it and put it, you know, in, in a bag for you and stuff. And normally uh, it's not that watery as the other kind of chicken from the super normal supermarket. <laughs> Super, super, super. Yeah, I, I, it's different from, you know, buying one from direct from the farmer. Yes, for sure. I mean, when you buy it fresh and you, you know, from a farmer and he can, can eat for you or whatever. It is. Yeah. For sure. 
Where the, the bread is cooking is almost done. Can you put this in the sink? Yeah, I, I, I buy from a group. There's a group of 14 farmers and so I can buy fresh chicken and turmeric and ginger and. Okay. Can I ask you, Rada, which part of the world are you in where you're close to a farm? I have to drive five hours to get to my closest farm. Where we are in Southern Illinois, there is a bunch of farms. Oh, you too are on Carbondale. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Excuse <laughs> me. You are fine. <laughs> yes. I've been, I've been raising um, chicken this past uh, summer. But you're able to find good ingredients in Carbondale. Yes, lucky me. We <laughs> almost have. I mean, farm. I mean, a bunch of uh, a bunch of spices and ingredients. If I do not find them in international grocery, um, if somebody is going to St. Louis or something like that, I will ask him to just give him a list of shopping lists, basically, and ask him to bring it for me. Um, I mean, I know that in St. Louis, they have an international supermarket um, that has all the African and Middle Eastern ingredients and vegetables. And, and I mean, when I go there, I feel like I'm in heaven. So <laughs> like I help a lot, I mean, a lot of ingredients. But um, I still don't find uh, some vegetables that are quite popular in Morocco, especially during the winter time. And I know that in Florida and in California. Like what kind of vegetable? You know, the artichoke. Really? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, let me finish. It's the called a sun choke. I think. So there is like a, a branch of it, something close to the artichoke branch that's basically you can just cut and, you know, soak in water and lemon and eat it raw like that. Or you can cook it with preserved lemon in a tagine with lamb or with beef. And there is also another um, vegetables that look like apple. Yakut? And um, it's yellow, and it's I forgot to read it the name coins or something like that. I have a hard time to remember the name, but that one we cook it also in a in a beef tagine, and we caramelize this special vegetable in honey and butter. And we make it like a sour sweet dish. We have a lot of sour sweet dishes. So yeah, this is the kind of dish that I miss also in here. And I'm having a hard time to find. I'm gonna just check on the bread again. I'm gonna lower the rack so it's can um, Golden brown from the bottom. Golden brown from the bottom. That's fancy. You can also increase the heat. It was in 350. Oh. Now I'm going to increase it to 400. Let me bring the little one. This yeah. Oh. That's right. It's your show now. <laughs> he was mad. He was away for so long. He usually do not, you know, leave me alone. No, he don't want to. <laughs> He's like, what's going on? <laughs> so if you have other questions, feel free to ask while you're waiting for the bread. But the tagine, basically, it's ready. The fruit salad is ready, too. Yeah. Well, I would like you to finish your thought, Radia, about the fruit vegetable that you could not uh, think of that oh, was on yes. the tip of your tongue. 
So I, I don't remember actually the name of it in English. Um, just um, just um. Maybe tell. it's Quincy something Quince. like that. It's, it's Quince. Quince maybe it looks like an apple, right? Yes. Yes. Give so that fruit. one. That's well, the it, and, we, and... we don't eat it as a fruit. We eat it as a vegetable in a tagine, yeah. and we yeah we make it uh, oh, sweet oh, and yeah. And so then I the don't like. The other one you're asking about is is maybe cardoon, korchu. Korchuf, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that one. I mean, I mean, I love it with preserved lemon and olives. It just, it's been eight years, eight years since I had it. So I'm like, next time I go for a visit to Morocco, I will ask him to make it every day, I think for a week or so. You should be able to buy uh, Cardoon here. Let me, what? You should be able to buy them here if you know how to make the dish. I know how to make the dish, just I don't find it. I know that there is people who find it in California or in Florida because it has warmer weather and there's uh, other yes. variety of vegetables yeah. in there. She's, but, she's also in Carbondale, which is huh? Carbondale's not that big. So Wait a minute, yeah. but she says she can find most anything in an international market, that or St. Louis. I thought that's great. Yeah, it is, but there is some specific dishes that are specific to Moroccans and that, uh, I mean, Florida and California has a high pop Moroccan population, so I believe this is why you can find more diverse uh, options in terms of food and spices. But, uh, but mostly, yes, I can find like 98, 97% of the items that I normally use and that I grew up with. She's a little bit too excited. She's waiting for the tagine. <laughs> Hi, baby. You had fun? He's like discovering this is where they were hiding all this time. <laughs> right? Do you, do you have a sprouts market near you? No, or is shaking his head no, but his mute, he's muted, so we can't hear him. Yes, or you're muted. We're do you so... mean a farmer's market? Um, sprouts is a chain, but they have a lot of fruits and vegetables. Oh, uh, I mean, except for Walmart and Google and Schnucks. We are in a town of only slightly over 20,000 people. Yeah, you're not big enough town to have those kinds of things. You have to go to right. a big city. So St. Louis is, you know, two hours away, and that's the nearest right. town of size. But we right. do have a decently large international community because we're a university. And so we do have an international grocery. And they drive to Chicago and bring stuff. So. so in the yeah. old days, when even in LA, things weren't as international and my mother was taking cooking classes, yeah. she used to have to special order all the vegetables from the market. And the produce manager really actually kind of liked doing it because he, he had an excuse for bringing in all the exotics. He had customer requests. I need the, I need the um, our international grocery will do that, but not for fresh stuff, just in case someone won't buy it, right. you know, so he could resell it to somebody else. So you, you have to really play a game with him. You, you call and you request it. You have a few friends call and request it. A few more call and request it. And then when somebody stops in and says, by the way, do you have such and such? He'll get it. <laughs> yeah, I'm good friends with him because I've done like, you know, for four years, every Friday, we'd have an international slow food dinner. And that's right. what we're kind of trying to replicate here. And so we, we'd have a lot of special order stuff because, you know, people need a certain, it's not even just a certain spice. They wanted a certain brand of a certain spice because that's what they're used to in their country. That is super specific. 
So my like, experience you know, yeah. is that certain spices taste very, very different when you change brands. Yep. That's right. And so on um, the same bread. Now um the tagine is ready. Waiting for the bread. And yeah, we're waiting for the bread. <laughs> <laughs>